Here, in the deep tropical forest of Yucatan, lie secrets of a culture once magnificent and strong, yet ultimately vulnerable. This is a place where a people lived and prospered for centuries. And the minds that envisioned the city, the hands that build these structures, the people who walk these paths, have much to teach us. When we choose to listen. Good morning. How are you? Good. What's up? Millsaps runs an international nonprofit uh, called Kashilki Week. Mm -hmm. And this international nonprofit then serves as our base of operations uh, for our Yucatan program. It's not a piece of shell that I think might have been worked at one time, mm -hmm. maybe on a necklace, but you can't really tell. Mm -hmm. so. At the reserve, we have the archaeological site of Key Week, which provides undergraduates with a unique opportunity to do uh, cutting edge archaeological field work at a major Maya center. And all of this is right on top of the bedrock, which I have a soil sample of. Okay, so no more bones today? Uh, we do have a few bones. Mm -hmm. Well, for people who are interested in pursuing particularly anthropology and biology, it gives them uh, great opportunities to do things outside the box and in the field. For, for a lot of students, this means allowing them to develop uh, professional skills that are usually not available to an undergraduate. In most colleges, you don't get an opportunity like this as an undergraduate. You only have these opportunities as graduate students because you're competing with graduate students at bigger schools. And so being at Millsaps and being able to actually do all these study abroad opportunities really helps when you are, say, going to graduate school or, say, even if you don't go to grad school and you just go straight into the field looking for a job. I think the Millsaps program is remarkable. It's remarkable because it is not easy to get opportunities to work abroad in a variety of different kinds of scientific endeavor in the context of a thriving uh, indigenous culture such as the Maya world. So if you imagine Jane and Garrick, and Garrick's been here two years, they've literally drawn every rock that you see. <laughs> so it's, it's painstaking work. Uh, it, it also trains young men and women in a lot of skills that we believe in here at Millsaps College, such as uh, self-reliance, uh, citizenship, uh, leadership, uh, critical thinking. So students might not pursue anthropology, they might pursue a degree in law or in business, and the kinds of things they learn by working with us in the field they find very useful in those pursuits as well. The now well-worn path from Melsops College to Kiwik has been filled with adventure for the past decade. Students study archaeology in this region, but are also immersed in the culture of the modern-day Maya, who confront new challenges in a rapidly changing world. It is here that students can certainly study a culture, but they can also help preserve and ultimately transform our understanding of this land and its people. The site of Kiwik is a uh, Maya community that was founded around 800 BC. So it's one of the oldest known archaeological sites in the, that part of the world. It continued to grow until about 1000 AD, so the city of Kiwik is about 1800 years old. We're standing here at the edge of the early palace of uh, Kiwik. Uh, one of the things that makes the archaeology here at Kiwik so important is that in fact we are doing a detailed excavation 
of one of the early royal courts of the Maya and the northern Maya lowlands. We have a lot of information about the later, more elaborate periods, somewhat like the Renaissance period for the Maya for this area, but this is the early period. We are in front of the main pyramid of the site. This is called the Grupo Jasche. Jasche is the name of a Maya tree, which is called the Seba, which is very central. So this is the main plaza for Kiwik. The excavations are really focusing on the excavation of what we think is the first palace of the city. And because it's the first palace, we think it has the longest history. So at this point, we're trying to determine the kind of culture history of the site up to a certain point. We are in our sixth week, so you're catching us at the end. But when we originally started, this whole facade was just complete rubble. And um, we started by just basically taking off the rocks. Pyramids are important because they are like uh, shrines or they are representing sacred mountains. Excavations of these sacred mountains is done by various teams. And then these teams uh, consist of a number of Maya gentlemen from nearby communities that Millsaps has worked with for almost a decade now, really skilled men who do the uh, excavations. The students themselves don't tend to do much digging, except when there's finer work to do. Their job is to learn how uh, to run an operation, so they're put into a fairly important role right from the start. Buenos dias. While one team works on the pyramid space, another team is removing rubble from its top. Okay, vamos a ver que tenemos. <laughs> Yeah, bueno. The reason that it's important for us to use people from the neighboring communities is because it allows us to uh, work with the, um, the descendants of the Maya. So this puts us in direct connection with the uh, people whose culture we're working with. And at the same time, it gives people from local communities a chance to actually um, um, explore their own heritage. So it's given us a chance to really um, work closely with the community in developing um, an understanding of the past together. Oh no. Puro relleno, no, Oli? Yeah, it's important to realize that when we started, we were on top of the building, so that what you're looking at in these profiles, like here, where this ladder is, that's the roof of the building that's caved in on top. And you can actually see the lines of stones, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the building caved in on itself. Yeah, we still have to take the photos. But something like this is going to take, for us to get from the top of this to the bottom, is probably going to take us two years of work. Because you have to go very slowly. We go about 50 centimeters, stop, put the cement in, and then continue. Otherwise, the walls will cave in. So if you do it carefully, this is very safe. But otherwise, people could get hurt in here. So we're not going to create any kind of situation like that. But this is one of the ways you get inside a pyramid. You dig a big hole through the top. It does take a lot of patience. We keep motivating ourselves by saying there's something inside this building, because it would be so depressing to go down 40 feet and not find anything except rocks, but that's not going to be the case. We're going to find something fantastic in here. What we're doing is entering into one of the plazas of the uh, royal court. The palace, which we call the Yashche Palace, uh, was built probably beginning around 550 AD and really represents the transformations of a fairly egalitarian level culture to a highly ranked culture in which the city was led by, we believe, a king. And um, so what we're entering here is the remains of this royal palace. And I'm going to show you the three uh, courts or three plazas that formed what really was a Maya royal court. So if you think of uh, a European royal court like Versailles, which is of course much huger, 
you're going to think that part of it was for the residents of the royal family. Other parts were for servants, other parts were for administrative functions, other parts were for scribes, the royal bodyguards, the royal chapel. Well, think about it this way as we walk through the Yashche Palace, that what you're looking at is a similar situation, although from a Maya perspective. The experience living here is one of the best that um, most people out in the field get. People would joke and say it's like Club Med. They have a great time and um, we have a great time. In all the years that I've had students down there, we've never had anyone asked to go home. And many of our students come back year after year. And I have students now that are in graduate school, Vanderbilt, uh, Kentucky, Tulane, UNC, Chapel Hill, that just won't go away. They've now continued to do their dissertations. So maybe I'm a little dry, but I think they must be having some kind of fun because we have them coming back for five, six, eight years, even after they've graduated. The food here on the project has been excellent. We have a full-time cook, her name is Telma, and she is a Mayan native. She is a um, classically trained cook. Her mother was a very famous cook in this area and um, she's been with us through the past 10 years. Where I'm walking to, where I'm standing, is what we call Zunun Plaza. And we believe this is the civic ceremonial plaza for the palace. Uh, underneath us, we find the remains of the earliest village at Kiwik. So, rather interestingly, the community that we know as Kiwik, which we believe was founded around 800 BC, uh, began here and thus uh, the entire evolution of this culture is centered here on this spot. So the royal palace, this palace, is actually built on the remains of what was probably the first uh, settled village life in this area. Uh, there are several major buildings I'd like to point out that will give you some understanding of what this plaza is about. Uh, this one here uh, is called the Popol Na, and as you can see, it's characterized by some really distinct architectural features. One is several staircases, but very broad staircases. And a lot of times people think of the Maya as having these high pyramidal stairs that are very treacherous, and that's true. But this type of building is characterized by broad stairs. And then the building up on top is a single uh, long room. Originally, it had six or seven doorways. So it was a single long chamber uh, composed of a number of doorways. At a latter period in time, they were closed. So if you imagine, what you had was one long open building and a series of open stairs. This is considered to be good evidence that this was what we call a council house, a building where the Maya men would have met to carry on the kinds of daily activities associated with the community, sort of a, um, a governmental house. And these broad stairways would have permitted great a great way for people to have sat and talked and chit-chatted while they were going about their business. This kind of stairway is easy for people to sit on. And also, as you can see here, it fronts this big plaza. So it would have been a great, a great place for ceremonies and dances, almost as if this could have been a reviewing stand. So the building is very typical of uh, the kind of early royal courts of the Maya, such as the one at, at, at Kiwi. Around the sides of the plaza are uh, buildings which we haven't reconstructed yet, but would have been other kinds of administrative buildings, we think, supporting the civic and ceremonial functions of this plaza. Our idea for environmental citizenship was to use Yucatan as a place to begin thinking about um, issues in sustainability, uh, globalization, 
environmental uh, degradation. And so what we did was we tended to focus on the Maya and their experiences as they've tried to adapt to the environment from the pre-Columbian through the modern times, which is great because the Maya, as you know, uh, suffered a, a severe natural collapse or cultural collapse around 900 to 1000 AD. So uh, the Ma we know even prehistorically they were facing great environmental challenges and they continue to do so today. And we live on site. So we have built an off-the-grid research and learning center in the jungle. It consists of dormitories and uh, faculty guest housing, classrooms, laboratory, and kitchen. So there's about 12 or 13 buildings out there. The dormitories are hooked up to solar power plant. So all of our energy comes from the sun and once you use up the energy, or if there's no sun, then you don't have any lights or any fan or any electricity to pump water with. One of the things I've noticed staying here for six weeks is that uh, as an American, I use a lot of excess, um, excess electricity, excess water. I don't really need to take a 20 minute shower. And uh, to come out here and be able to live in harmony with the environment and not destroy it. Um, I think it's pretty rewarding and I hope I can take some of that back with me to the States. The Yashche Palace was probably first founded around 550 AD. Around that time it moved from an egalitarian society to a stratified society. That building that we just talked about, the council house, probably represented the first major vaulted or major architectural uh, investment by the community. And at this time, the, the community still was um, largely involved in day-to-day -day decisions. But what was going on at this end of the plaza gives us evidence of the transformations going on in the social structure of uh, the community. Behind me, you can see the remains of a uh, pyramid. And this pyramid uh, is the final result of construction that goes back to at least uh, the pre-classic period or before Christ and continued until the collapse of the city. Now, it's a very difficult building to understand and we have been investing a lot of our energy in trying to understand this because a lot of the social organization and transformation occurring in Maya society is reflected, we believe, in the changes that took place in this building. What you're looking at here, these terraces, are the final building when this structure consisted of a large pyramid. Uh, the stairway, which we're putting back up now, as you can see here, has been removed so that we can see more clearly the platform. This pyramid is fascinating because it's built very late after this palace is largely abandoned or no longer the central focus. So as we've been moving backward in time, you can see both on the uh, right-hand side and over on the left-hand side, the remains of earlier buildings that were buried. What they're doing here is they're burying what we believe is the royal residence for the royal family of this palace. The question then becomes, why do that? Why turn the king's quarters within the palace into a pyramid. And our hypothesis is, is that what they're doing is when they build the new palace, they're memorializing the royal family, giving, turning it from a palace into a monument. Think about if they built a new White House and then buried the old White House under a giant memorial that in essence legitimized the authority passing on to the new White House, while at the same time causing, creating, and restoring the memory of that old White House. So that's what's going on here. Archaeology, to a large extent, is fairly boring, just like any job on a day-to-day -day basis, and they learn that. So they might be working on a building for days and find, they find a lot of stuff, uh, so there's a lot of material. But after a while, you get used to pot shirts and little stone tools and things coming out and they, they do a good job recording and doing basic archaeology. But it's usually once or twice a summer, the, the teams uncover something that's amazing. And at that point, uh, it's, as you might imagine, they're very excited. This is an amazing discovery. They feel like they're participating in something they've only dreamed about, uh, this kind of moment of, of uncovering the past. One is that 
the students were uncovering a stairway which was covered in about five million pounds of rubble. So they remove all the rubble and finally they see there's a stairway there. And then they begin to dig below the stairway and at that point they hit a body which had been burned and cremated and thrown into this um, sacrificial, we believe, pit. So all of a sudden, they're looking at a, base, at a moment in time when this human being was uh, probably burned and deposited into this burial. And it, it, from there, it transforms into a very different kind of experience for them and a very highly detailed, intensive kind of work. This plaza was probably a private space used by the royal family for the worship of their ancestors. I'm standing on the remains of one of two temples that frame this plaza. The second one is over there and has not been reconstructed yet. And this one, which was a single vaulted chamber that was built um, probably in the late 700s, early 800s. Back at the lab, teams clean, label, and record every artifact brought from the site each day. They also grapple with how to put each new discovery within its proper cultural context. Before the surface of this cache, there was a large stone we thought was in Lajada mm -hmm. because it was very large, very flat. Does it fit within the existing understanding of the place, or does it challenge that understanding? These are questions that allow students the extraordinary opportunity to become part of this transformative process. Okay, we're just entering the third plaza and the Yashche group is called Ikim Plaza and we believe this is the residential part of the palace. We've just come from the religious uh, Plaza Ulum, across the civic ceremonial or administrative part of the palace, and now into the residential area. We're standing in front of the best preserved structure in the Yashche Palace. This is how we found the building. It's a multiple room structure. You can see down there the third part of this building has collapsed, but these two rooms are intact, and we believe that these rooms represent the style of architecture in the residential part of the palace. These are vaulted chambers, very nicely done, and are defined by the use of these types of columns. And the columns are oftentimes quite different in style. If you look at the later palace, which is much more elaborate and the scale is much larger, you'd be struck by just how uh, small in some ways this building is. Um, However, it's still quite impressive. The other important thing to consider is that these buildings were not gray stone structures. Uh, all the buildings that we've been talking about, including, including the ones in Ikim Plaza, were, would have been covered with a beautiful coating of stucco and then brightly painted red, blue, green, yellow, so that you can imagine this pillar would have been very colorful. These designs here would have been highlighted in different colors. The building itself would have been brightly colored. And then this entire plaza and the palace itself would have stood uh, almost neon-like against the jungle landscape with these brightly colored buildings. We're excavating a part of the site that's um, maybe a couple kilometers away from the site center because throughout the reserve there are other archaeological remains. And this place was uh, discovered by my colleague Tomas Gaiaretta who is a big uh, Led Zeppelin fan. And it's on top of a hill, so he called it Stairway to Heaven. Here up on this hilltop, we have what looked to be a group, a large group of households. It's based on all the materials that have been recovered from this platform this year, it looks like a kitchen. Um, a lot of jars, probably storage jars, recovered from inside the room, even right on the floor. We had a lot of whole vessels that had been smashed over time through the collapsing of of the structure and just exposure to rain and elements, but um, it looks as though uh, everything that we excavated here and what was done last year in other parts of this hilltop um, seem to indicate that 
the hilltop was abandoned fairly suddenly. As the students began to clean it, they realized that the building had been left as it was at the moment of abandonment. So what starts out as a very kind of mundane task of clearing off the soil, the first thing was that these three young women, it was an all-female team, uh, uncovered an offering in one corner of the building. So I go up there one day and they've got these two beautiful pots that, are, that they uncovered. And from there on, almost every day they were finding something amazing, a cache of axes. And then as they cleaned the interior of the room, they found the entire, it would be like if you walked out of your kitchen, left smashed, everything was smashed on the floor. So um, in that particular case, this is an amazing discovery and really a very important one. So they were um, thrilled as I, as I was to have that happen. Sometimes archeology span isn't so much about what there is, but what there isn't. And in the case of Ikeem Plaza, what there wasn't has been a major clue for us in thinking about the way this uh, residential plaza might have looked uh, 700 AD. Uh, where I'm standing is, was covered with stucco, concrete. The plazas we visited, the large ceremonial plaza, the religious area, those were covered in thick coatings of stucco and as we've showed you, many floors of stucco. So when we dug over here in this part of the plaza, we were surprised to find a total lack of plaza floors. The only thing that characterizes the middle of the Ikeem Plaza is dirt. And so you can, you can or perhaps cannot see that around the edges, there's actually the edge of the plaza with a very well-defined area where there was no stucco. We think that this indicates that this area was in fact left green. Uh, perhaps park-like, that there were trees and plants here that would have really softened this plaza and made it much more enjoyable for families and people who would have worked and lived here. And we imagine that this place would have supported the staff of the royal family, as well as scribes, uh, others who would have carried out elite activities, artisans uh, and uh, warriors that would have served the royal family. It's the end of the field season, and students load up artifacts to be transported for further analysis. Some of them will be sent to Millsaps College, to its state-of-the-art Keck laboratory. This is an incredibly unique feature and unusual lab for a college like Millsaps to have. And that, I do not know of any college in America undergraduate that has this facility and certainly not the expertise and staff among multiple departments that are truly interdisciplinary that were willing to share those abilities and resources for a focused project. I have very sincere, um, thankful feelings for this project because it does give you a great opportunity to learn new skills. We do have a small field course here in, that you can do in Jackson, but it doesn't even closely come to what you do in the field in Kiwi. People often call projects being interdisciplinary when they simply combine two fields and present the material both in a course or in a project that's going. I say this project is truly interdisciplinary because in this case I generate a lot of the physical evidence. What was used in a pottery sherd, what residue is found in it, and I can do the chemical characterization of what they're made out of. What I can't answer is the cultural context of how it was used. So it's very interesting to kind of be in the middle of two worlds. On one side I know how to work all of the instruments in this lab and the kinds of information that I can get from doing wet chemistry and uh, analytical chemistry and also I know how to take the information that is given to me from an instrument and put it in context with a culture, with a site and kind of determine information from th that point on. I really enjoyed it just because I read so much about the Maya and I had kind of fantasized like what it would be like to go to the Maya region and it was just really amazing to bring everything that I'd read in books and everything I'd researched to life. I always like to think that we base society today on precedence of what has been done in the past and so in order to understand ourselves today we have to 
look back on history. They're not only studying and learning, but they're actually contributing to sustaining a cultural, a biological part of the world. In other words, this forest, these people, these archaeological ruins.